Well, our next guest is a highly respected expert on the issue of life as a physician. He delivered more than 5,000 babies. He knows a little bit about this issue, and today he serves as a congressman for Kansas' first district, and he's fighting in Congress to protect people like Melissa and Josiah and Claire that you just heard from, and many more. He is a doctor, devoted husband for 36 years, and a loving father of four children with two grandchildren. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome from the great state of Kansas, Dr. Roger Marshall. Thank you. Thanks. Wow. Thank you. Thanks. A good afternoon, everybody. These little hats, wow, aren't those the cutest things? I'm going to need one of these. Um, you know, the nursery, I, I remember the, the little volunteers every day sitting back here and making little pink, pink hats and, and little blue hats. What a great idea, and I hope that you all can support this. Uh, first of all, I wanted to just share a few comments uh, from my whip, Steve Scalise. Uh, Steve called me yesterday just to talk about what, what maybe he, we should be sharing today. And he and Adam Wagner have led the charge on this discharge petition for born alive children. Children, babies that survived abortions. And um, I just want to let you all know what a great job you are doing. So often people back home ask me, gosh, I feel like I just got a little voice and, and I'm not, my, my prayers uh, aren't going anywhere. But Steve pointed out to me that we recently had two congressmen elected, special elections in North Carolina. And the very first official act that they did was sign our discharge petition, our Born Alive discharge petition. <laughs> And the, these are both godly men, and, and I know that, they, that it was the right thing in their heart, but thanks to grassroots organizations like the Family Resource Council and your own grassroots organizations, as we're going through these election processes, we sit there and listen. We try to listen and say, well, what's an important, what's, what's a priority? And I just want you to know that your prayers are being answered, that people are listening to them. And I, I happen to think of another story uh, from this past week as well. I was visiting with an archbishop, and he made the comment that President Trump is the most pro-life president we've ever had. And I'm telling you, that's an answer to your prayers. It is absolutely an answer to your prayers that for such a time as this, such a time as this, God is you going to use President Trump for his pro-life agenda. This is the president that gave us two Supreme Court judges that are pro-life, and he may have a chance to appoint another one. And who knows, next term when President Trump wins again, he may have a chance to appoint more pro-life judges as well. So absolutely. So, so, so proud of, of this pro-life president and, and to work uh, with Republicans that want to be pro-life as well. Maybe I'll, st I'll start next and just share a little bit about my story, if, if I could, and why this issue is so very near and dear to my heart. Uh, I grew up a fifth-generation farm kid in Kansas, and my dream was to become a doctor. Um, and I, I was the first person for my, first, for my family to go to college and got elected in, into medical school, uh, married the, the love of my life about two weeks before medical school started. And uh, two years later, when all the doctors are deciding, you know, what's my specialty going to be? And I'm going to be an internal medicine doctor or a surgeon or an orthopedic doctor. We had our first baby. And the moment that girl, little girl was born, <laughs> I just got to tell you, it was the greatest moment of my life. And I said, I want to share that with other people. That's what I want to do is I want to deliver healthy babies. And um, so, so we went on and, and became, uh, we, we chose a residency program. And the first thing that I had to do to choose a residency program, I wanted to choose a place where none of the residents were doing abortions, where none of the doctors were being trained to do abortions. And I wouldn't be pressured to, to say, no, I, I, of course I can't participate in abortion. So I chose a residency program that met all those criteria. I get there and it's in South Florida, probably uh, two or three weeks into my, my first year. And I get a call from the emergency room, a stat call from the ER, uh, that they need an OB resident there. So I ran down three flights of stairs across the hallway and walked into a room. And, and forgive me, this is a little graphic, but, it, but the truth sometimes is graphic. But I walked into a room. A young lady was literally ba bathing in her own blood, that she was just covered in blood and just hemorrhaging like I'd never seen a person hemorrhage before. 
And I, and I asked someone, well, what's going on here? Why is, she, why, why is she bleeding like this? And they said, oh, she'd had a botched abortion. I said, well, what do you mean? So I figure out right away that she has a piece of placenta stuck inside of her uterus, and I need to get it out there. But I look beside us, and there's a little baby, much like Josiah, uh, whose arm was laying there limp and had been pulled out of socket. And what had happened was that this uh, a person across town was doing a late-term abortion, they pulled out this baby's arm, as they often do, and they said, oh my gosh, this baby is further along than we thought, which often happens as well. And they knew it would be a crime for them to proceed with the abortion. Well, anyway, they come across town, they deliver this, this premature baby, and the point I want to drive home here is that these late-term abortions, late ultrasounds can be off three or four weeks. Uh, so I'm afraid that some of these abortions are being done much later than what they're pretending they, they are. Now, we were able to save that woman's life. I'm very proud of that. But, but this wasn't the, the last time I had to face that type of problem. Um, moved back to Great Bend, Kansas. Great Bend is about a two-hour drive from Wichita, Kansas. And I'm not sure if anybody in this audience has heard of the name George Tiller. But uh, uh, Dr. Tiller, I hate to even use the term that he was a doctor, was perhaps the most, um, gosh, infamous abortionist, late-term abortionist in the country, and people flew in from all over the, the country for him to do late-term abortions. So from time to time, the complications from those abortions would end up in my emergency room. And what the media won't talk about is that late-term abortions have much higher complications, much higher complication rates for moms, and as more and more of these happen more commonly, more women are going to die from these late-term abortions. They're technically very difficult, uh, much at a high risk to perforate the uterus. Pieces of the baby are left behind, pieces of the placenta are left behind, and that's why the women come into our ERs hemorrhaging, uh, not to mention the, the, the pelvic infections that they may get that may end their future fertility as well. So taking care of complications of late-term abortions, or for that matter, any abortions, was part of the career of any obstetrician. So um, for, for whatever reason, the national media has given me this platform to talk about some of these, and, and for such a time as this, I've been called to stand up. I want to talk, though, a little bit about some positive things as well. And I'm often asked the question, why, uh, what's your favorite part of a pregnancy? Or what, that, that whole delivery process. And I just want to kind of share some of my favorite memories. And, and um, you know what, oftentimes, um, six or seven weeks along, we're, a woman would come in and for whatever reason we would need to do a sonogram. And seeing that little baby's heartbeat, Again, just a month after conception, we can see a baby's heartbeat. And, of course, that was a special moment. And, and when they're about 12 weeks along, they would come in for a visit. And by then, the nausea and vomiting starting to get a little bit better, and, and there's some changes happening to their body, and we're, and we're able to hear that heartbeat for the first time in about 12 weeks. So that's always a great visit. Somewhere around 17 or 18 weeks, uh, moms would come in and, and they would, I would ask them the question, are you, are you feeling your baby move yet? And their eyes would light up, and, and of course they were. They were feeling the baby move, and maybe they'd have a, their older child with them, like maybe a little three- or four-year-old. And I'd be having my hands on that, on that baby 16, 17 weeks along, and I'd be listening to that baby's heartbeat, and the, the leather little one in the room would squeal. Oh, that's my baby brother. And when that, would, when that little voice happened, the baby, the fetus, the, the unborn baby would move in that woman's womb. Time after time, it would recognize that little voice. And their heart rate would go up. Um, you just knew that this baby inside this, this womb knew that its brother or sister was out there. So that was a great visit. Um, getting to see the sex of the baby was never my big deal. Uh, I was always, the, 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 everyone wants to know the sex of the baby, but I, I can promise you I never told one person, not my own wife, what anybody was having, whether it was a boy or girl. Um, because I didn't want to be the person that spoiled that, that moment. <clears throat> and, you know, the rest of the pregnancy was hopefully un uneventful. But I'll tell you what, my favorite moment, uh, the baby was, is born. And every baby that was born, uh, I would start saying a, a silent prayer to, it, uh, to God for that baby, for the baby's soul, for its salvation, for its health, for that family. And I would pray until the baby started crying. And sometimes the babies would come out screaming, and I'd say, oh, boy, good luck with this one, Mom and Dad. And... <laughs> And, and sometimes they didn't, though. And, 
10 seconds would seem like 10 minutes. Um, but my favorite moment, though, was handing that crying baby to that new moored mom, mom and dad and just seeing that that moment that was so, so special to them. That, and it brought me back to my memories of, of our first baby. So certainly, uh, that, that's what motivates me to get up here and, and talk about this. One of the things I tried to do in my practice was make sure that uh, every woman could get prenatal care regardless of their financial situation, regardless of their personal situation, and um, kind of developed a reputation for helping moms out when other doctors had recommended they have an abortion. And, and if I could just share two quick stories, and, and these are stories that are often told, but uh, the, the first story is a young lady whose name is Kara, and she, she's on our Facebook, and you could, so I'm not violating any of her privacy, but she was a young lady. She and her twin brother were my oldest son's age. I coached her in basketball. She grew up to be a wonderful woman. And her, her third, I delivered two of her babies, and I believe it was her third baby. Um, we, we saw something wrong on the ultrasound, maybe when she was 14 or 16 weeks along. And she went and visited, got consultations and all the things that you do. And the doctors had recommended that she have an abortion, that this baby uh, had a heart defect that was not compatible with life. And she came back to my office and said, they want me to have an abortion. Do I have to have an abortion? And I said, well, of course you don't have an abortion. Um, we don't know what God's got in store for this baby. And we saw Kara through the pregnancy and sent her to Kansas City when it came time to have that baby. And she, she delivered the baby. And guess what? That baby did some things the doctors didn't think it could do and had a couple surgeries and I suppose that baby's nine or ten years old now and and uh, I don't know if living happily ever after but doing very very well and yeah, exactly <clears throat> the being a being a doctor is so humbling uh, I can't tell you how many times uh, the sonogram reports are not accurate um, we, we do our best but we can't always tell and you know, I always give the benefit of the doubt to the baby and trust that God can still work miracles. Um, an another lesson that I, that I would learn is uh, another patient that I had who had a baby with um, was either I think trisomy 13, and, and trisomy 13 is lethal. No, no babies live long after they're, they're born uh, with that particular problem. And most women go off and, and have an abortion, but she came to me and said, I wanna carry this pregnancy. And she taught me so much uh, about, about life and about the true heart of a, of a mother that she wanted to go through the pregnancy. And it was tough. It was one of the hardest pregnancies I've ever had to take care of. You could imagine being in the, out in the, in the waiting room and there's a, a dozen other women out there and they're pregnant and things are going well and they're looking forward to, to so much with this baby. And she knew from, from the time she was 20 weeks along that her baby was not going to survive. But she, she, for, what, for, the, for many reasons, she wanted to go through things as naturally as possible. And I remember delivering that little baby, and it, it breathed and it cried, and it tried so hard. And, you know, the, the baby didn't survive. We didn't expect it to survive, but, but it maybe lived for 8 or 12 hours. And just how important that time was to this family. Um, as a guy, I just didn't get that growing up. I didn't understand uh, about this part of life. Uh, but it was so important for them to have that opportunity to love this baby, uh, to baptize the baby, to b get God's blessing on this baby. So we kind of developed a reputation for women across the state that would come to us uh, to go through uh, tough pregnancies. Uh, the young girls that didn't know who the father was or, or, or uh, just had from tough times is to put together that team. And I'm so grateful for the many great nurses I had because really the onus, of course, falls on the nurse in many instances. And, and organizations like Catholic Social Services have always been beside us as well, helping to get those moms all the social issues that she, she needs. And one thing that I would always tell every young mom, the best thing you could do for this baby is to stay in school and, and graduate. So try to make sure help those moms have some you know, a financial path to be able to stay in school and, and have the, the support that they would need. So I always thought that was a very, very important part of my practice. So, um, you know, those are some of the reasons why this issue is so, so important to me. All those personal stories and, 
And you know, maybe I'll just kind of close with just a little, a, a few parting thoughts here for you all that um, this, this country has lost its moral compass. It's lost it. And if we're going to ever find it again, it's going to start with us. We still have, a, God's people still have a moral compass, and I've not given up hope. That, that we can still keep praying. We can still elect presidents that think it's okay to have faith. Um, but for such a time as this, we've all, all been called. And, it, and of course, I'm thinking of the book of Esther, a, a scripture you all are very familiar with, that, that Esther, uh, at, at a very important moment in her life, was afraid to stand up for her people. And her cousin Mordecai said, Esther, who knows that for such a time as this, you've been called to stand up. And I just want to encourage everybody in this room, everybody in the listening audiences at home, that, that remind you that your prayers are working, your prayers are important, that for such a time as this, we've all been called to stand up and give this country a moral compass. I would have never dreamed that I would have to fight harder to protect newborn babies on the house floor than I did in the delivery room. I would have never dreamed a governor standing up and saying it's okay to murder newborn babies. And that's why this Born Alive Petition Act is so important. If I could just explain briefly what, what it, this is about. So Nancy Pelosi refuses to let us vote on this Born Alive Act that protects newborn babies from, uh, that, that if they're born they would have the same rights as every other American if they survive an abortion. But there's something called a discharge petition that if I can get 218 Congress members to sign on to this discharge petition, she has to allow us to vote on it. So we have 197 out of 197 Republicans on this legislation. And again, I think that's a reflection of, of your efforts, uh, of, of Family Research Coun Council's efforts, as well as grassroots organizations across the country. Um, we've only got three Democrats on the, on the bill. Uh, Pro-life Democrats are an endangered species, unfortunately. Uh, they're so scared that if they voice their pro-life opinion that they will uh, get, that Nancy Pelosi will find someone to run a primary against them, that they'll cut, she'll cut off their funding. All the things that a powerful person in Washington, D.C. can do uh, keeps them from speaking forward. Because I know there's many godly men and women that are Democrats in Congress that know that murdering a newborn baby is wrong. So my ask for you is to identify Democrats from I'll call them swing district, districts that President Trump won, but a Democrat was elected. Uh, swing, swing districts are, are districts that typically may have a Republican one Congress and a Democrat. Those Democrats from swing districts are the ones that are at risk, and Tony and Family Resource Council does a great job of helping us identify them. When you make your efforts in Congress, to my, in my office, you're preaching to the choir. I need you all to focus on a handful, some 25, 30 very vulnerable Democrats that need your, your support as well. So that's my ask for you, that for such a time as this, we've all been called. Thank you so much for happening. God bless you all. Thank you so much.